certifications of internal control training and there are several everybody on the council except for Amy because she new hasn't has signed one and doesn't have to do it again but you have to watch a video and read a policy and then certify that you did it and then I have to attest that you saw it so um, I've got a list of people that have been hired since the last time it was done and anyone that has fiscal responsibility or handles money has to do it so I'll be taking care of all that and then um, at the end, behind your presentations is a budgeting for council members. Um, there was a training, a training uh, workshop for that. Um, um, so it's geared for your, your level of detail that you're going to get into. And so I thought it'd be useful for you since I'm going to be trying to tacking the budget from a different direction than prior years. So that's why you have that. Uh, before we go into old business, first of all, thank you all for coming. I know why most of you are here. Hopefully the letter that we sent out, um, I sent out to you, had some explanation. And, and Mitch, our engineer that's been on this project for quite some time, will answer some questions here shortly. But I know we have other discussions going on tonight. Uh, just asking you, can you concise to the point? Um, we want to um, obviously uh, work with the public in the best possible way, but also uh, do what's the betterment of the whole community. Uh, but before we go further, I promised Rick Randstead I'd give him a chance to speak. Since this meeting will be lengthy, he normally would be toward the end of the program. So, Rick, I know you got something to announce. Yes, good news. We got a contract signed with Parkview. So, we did get a contract signed. There will be three ambulances eventually, uh, probably 1st of July. Uh, for the time frame, 45 days. They think they got a line on three brand new ambulances to bring in. <coughs> so they thought they could have them within 45 days. So we're keeping our fingers crossed that they get enough people to staff all the ambulances on day one. They may not on day one, but hopefully they will. So I, I know I talked to Trent about it a little bit earlier. So uh, I did come and see if you guys got any other questions or any other things you need me to answer. Congratulations. Yep, yep, yeah. big deal. It really is. I mean, yeah. Glad to get that money. Right, <laughs> <laughs> it ain't started yet, but we're, we're glad to have that. So, welcome again. They got some, you know, some ties to the county, so it should be a good fit. They got the helicopter, and they're working with Ruben Hospital on a few projects. So, we're glad to have them aboard. So, if you see any of them or whatever, introduce yourself. We will be setting up a board. To, to carry on for the next year to make sure everything's happening the way they will. And there'll be a Ro Rochester representative, so that'll be up to probably the mayor or however you want to put somebody on that, that, on that board. So. Very good. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to the chairs. Right yeah. there. Yeah. Okay, whole business. Uh, Amy, you want to update? Yes. Um, we met together as a team or a committee uh, to talk about the Dora details and to discuss some concerns and questions that have come our way. Um, I have been speaking more intently with Aaron Shaver, who is the planning uh, 
director at Logan Sport, understanding all of the parts of the pieces related to what would need to be done to move forward, uh, reached out to Becca from AIM to ask some additional questions that I had needed to get clarified related to signage and um, indeed confirming that if we did the Dora that the restaurants would then no longer have to fulfill the need to have the fencing if they wanted to have the outdoor seating. And so when we went back to the to the table, we've got a couple of representatives here um, who may want to speak on behalf and just share their insight for just a couple seconds. Um, we decided to look at it in more of a um, condensed manner. I do have the map. Um, Casey Hensley is working on getting a tinier map that would be easier to use because that's what we would need to upload to the State Department. Um, but we do have this map. Um, Um, basically, it is encompassing just the area where the restaurants are, for the most part. So from, I think that's, uh, what, 5th Street here, um, where on Court is going all the way past American Legion, down past um, where the Arlington Pub House is, putting this parking lot there just in case they would want to use that for food trucks, and getting past that. Um, it excludes this area right here where this is mostly business, that's unnecessary. Um, and then has the, uh, the theater, um, Uncourt, and, um, or excuse me, uh, <coughs> Alice and the Evergreen. So that there, if we uh, chose this condensed version of the Dora, um, it would be really for the purpose of providing them the opportunity to not have the fencing as well as if the Rochester Downtown Partnership um, wanted to have some sort of food truck Friday or uh, some sort of uh, event there um, on this area. We have the ability to uh, do that in a more, a more um, convenient manner. So I've uh, went and uh, been taking signs, pictures of signs at Warsaw and Winona Lake and just kind of reviewing all of their information, talking to different people there. So trying to get the um, information that I need to be able to make sure that we um, review this effectively. I met with um, the attorney uh, Perkins this morning just to ask him um, his thoughts. And so uh, his suggestion was our next step was to get a nice condensed map, which we are working on, um, and put together a formal presentation to present to you um, at the next uh, city council meeting. But uh, I think the list is here, maybe somewhere. Alyssa, did you want to say anything? Um, yeah, I can if you, if you would like to. So um, what we see at night isn't necessarily people having a, a huge urge to just walk around town and drink at the same time, but especially our unique situation, having a brewery in the same building, we're constantly trying to stop people from sneaking a drink from one place to the next. And it, with this in place, the two that business and my business could work together and we could allow people to bring in a drink from uncorked to the brewery if you don't like beer or you know go have your uncorked dinner while you're drinking Tippecanoe beer so at least for us that specific reason would really help us a lot and we don't necessarily foresee people just walking around town drinking all the time <coughs> Um, but being able to expand and not have to enclose two separate patios would be great for our business as well. So we're really hoping we can get something like this working. And, and also during um, big events downtown, we can get people to come our way, you know, maybe sell them a drink while they're walking around looking at vendors, booths, and things like that, or an outdoor concert. So that's all. That's what we would like. Thanks. <laughs> Can you hit those switches back there? Thank you. Does that bother your uh, camera? Perfect, thanks. So, as a point of reference as well, I have talked to Banditos, I believe, and Mikey's. Um, some of the other members have talked to the other restaurants. Everybody is in favor of supporting this just because they feel like it will help for the ease of their business purposes. Um, obviously, with the caveat that we just want to make sure that everybody's safe when we do this and that it's done in the manner that makes sense. So, um, I think there's enough research and opportunity. I've looked at the other communities on the site.
site that Aaron sent me that have done this, and they are ranging in populations from 400 to 69,000 plus. So there are communities all over Indiana that have taken advantage of this specific legislation um, since it has been passed, I believe in 2022, revised it in 2023. Um, so I think for us, just wanting to continue to, to speak about this, make sure that you guys provide feedback as we're moving forward um, so that we can make sure that everybody has their I have, I have talked to several mayors, and I've yet to run across one that has regretted uh, doing this. So, uh, for this downtown exposure and events and so forth. So, something we will continue to move forward on. I mean, do you have anything you want to share? I think Alyssa said it right, like two phases, um, heavy on the event side, like chili cook off, have an area so they can walk around and without issue um, <clears throat> and with events you could organize the restaurants to work together and create in our steam evenings um, none of us really see it as great let's go downtown and take a walk and drink like it doesn't sounds like a line out of footloose but it, it's more creating an experience and being a part of it not just throw it out there and hope it sticks and we're looking at a more condensed version exactly. because we want to give everybody the opportunity to learn and to grow. And uh, Harry is part of this as well. He's working yeah. on the set of the city that he's in uh, registered downtown partnership. I don't know if he's talked to you about that. But yeah. yeah, so I think everyone's in favor. It's just figuring out what does it look like and what is the council comfortable with and how do we you know, move this forward? Erin, um, basically, when she did the application, she had all of the designated permit teams, which be every restaurant that wants to participate, apply with the application. The map that was actually, um, which we hope to have a nice map like this, and not this huge map, but a map like this, this is what Casey's working on. Um, so this area is where this is Logan Sports. Those red dots are the designated permit teams. So everybody is where what is and what is not in this area right here they added a separate section where individuals outside of the um, dora could come in maybe a brewery that was outside of the door could come in and have a special event permit which we talked about not doing um but they added those areas where somebody could come in during a special event and have a catering license to um sample maybe their beer or their wine with individuals that were attending so, um, we will, unless you guys they, say... They would have to get a special permit mm -hmm. uh, other than what, say, we have to do. If, if you were doing the same thing, right. based at the outside establishment, would still have to get a special permit. Correct. So, like, if, if the dam is not included in the Dora area, yeah. but wants to come in for for um, the the chili cook-off, right? They would have, they would need a special permit, which isn't that hard to get, but get a special permit to be part of that. Just and, and really, it's it's a really easy, simple advertising <coughs> thing to do. Other people are in town to just okay. If I'm part of it, then then people can know I'm here. Somewhere. <coughs> Yeah. I think it's like a one-pager part. It's a one-pager that we have to submit an application in addition to the design of our sign that would have to be on all the door exits, as well as, they say, uh, Becca from A said, conspicuous areas. So I, I was driving into Warsaw today, and I saw a door sign right as my entrance to work. It was right on the corner of Columbia and Center Street, just right there. I guess they say that's conspicuous. You're saying the door ends here, and if you want to see the door, here is a QR code that is always updated, and you look and you know when you're in and when you're out. So um, they make it simple. With the, what Aaron said, it was three weeks for approval, mainly because she put all of the effort on the front end, getting the logo, the map, the uh, sign design, and et cetera. So, so I don't know. No one has said anything. So as far as I understand you guys are still fine with me to move forward to research this with the committee. Um, oh, Monica's back there too. Okay. Monica. 
like, did you have anything? Um, I would say I think that is a great idea to see the door thing. Um, and it's not about having people just walking around town drinking, but like on certain events, like the um, chili cook-off, per se, instead of having like one beer garden, everyone can like share that opportunity to serve drinks around town and people can walk around. But um, my concern, and I don't know if like Lissa or Ruthless or anyone else that would be involved in it, certain situations like the carry in like for my establishment I wouldn't allow them to carry in they can walk around take the drink out but I don't think that I would allow anyone to come in with a open beverage because that just kind of gives the risk of people going out and bringing in their own beverages without supporting the local business so, so those are details we have to work out as well just understanding what that looks like there's a special cup that you can get that has the logo on it it has uh, the marks on it. This is what Local Sports doing that says, so that every bartender knows where the mark is and what is the legal amount of, of um, beer or wine or whatever beverage. This is where they can go <coughs> and it's not go past that way. So everybody is fair, and the cup is can be a uh, fundraiser for the Rochester Downtown Partnership, according to um, the. Uh, folks in local sport they do it for a fundraiser so there's many details to work out but lots of information that we've obtained in the committee um i just want to bless you to continue to move forward and to um <coughs> so
So is the food truck and the Dora two separate things, or is the food truck part of the Dora? I think or it would be separate be? things that we need to do. Yeah, they can benefit so each other, but they are separate ordinances. <coughs> Could somebody explain to me, if I got a one-year license, what does that enable me to do? Someone? I mean, can I, I mean, I guess my concern is where I'm going is, can I just, if I find somebody who's willing to let me park, can I just park in that same spot? Well, if, if you're I think what it says is if you receive the, the, the food truck permit uh, and, not, and you're not operating the food truck in any way that, that uh, uh, is contrary to the ordinance, then yes, you could. There is a, there is a line in there about private property. It is designed to simply clarify that nothing in the food truck ordinance gives anyone uh, permission to override the consent of the private property owner, but simply being on private property, uh, depending on how we end up writing the ordinance, simply being on private property does not inherently absolve someone of a food truck. You could write an ordinance in such a way that it does, but I think it's written, uh, we're saying within the city limits, if you're a food truck, uh, you're going to need a permit, regardless of whether you're on private property or not, and in its current form. I guess I would struggle personally with one year The simple way would be just not to have a one-year license. That's how it's option. I guess unless somebody else proposes. Your, your suggestion is to have shorter ones. Well, seven day to thirty day makes sense to me. I'm just, I guess, and, and if I'm wrong, that's, but my concern is I, I don't necessarily want to see a food truck sitting in the same spot all the time. Maybe some spots it would make sense, but. Okay. I don't know that I want to leave that open. You could have a one-year mm -hmm. license and still say no selling food at any location for more than 72 hours in a row, regardless of your license. So I, I think of a one-year license as more someone who expects to show up multiple times, uh, not someone who has a blanket license to sell for 365 days. Okay. I would think, I would if we think can write that, that so, so okay. that would work. I, I makes sense. Andy, what you discussed is that we never put a event application together. Correct. There will be an event application. And that will be, that will open the door for a food truck to get in for that event. And that's even shorter than 72 hours. I thought it was like a 24 hour deal. Well, I, I, I don't want to kind of confuse two ideas. Uh, there's the event. I, I think you're going to end up with an event application and a food truck application. And the one of the might or might not coincide with one. Right. One of the things that is in the uh, uh, is in the food truck ordinance is drafted is the ability for the board of public works to suspend parts of the food truck ordinance. I could, I could foresee a situation where a group comes in and wants an event where they're going to have a dozen trucks, but they're only going to be there for 12 hours, where the board of public works has the authority to say, we're going we're gonna to bypass the food truck ordinance for this event because it's an event. And, and that, I think that we're preserving the possibility that it's still be an option. And Mike, with the chamber, my question to Andy was, if the chamber who has to keep the trucks overnight, because they have to set up the night before the Rochester Downtown Partnership, in this it says no truck should be uh, parked overnight, and you said that on this application it would say you would have to, the Board of Works, approve a special exception for overnight, or if it was hooked up to water, Derek's not here, hooked up to water, or other utilities, right. then the Board of Works would have to actually put a special exception in the application overriding the it, 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 yeah. well, is the permit going to be separate from like the water hooked up and the electric hooked up? For a special, so unless I'm saying this wrong, for the event application it would say, let's say the Rochester Downtown Partnership comes and they say we've got a special event, uh, event from this state to this state, we need water hookup, we need electrical hookup, or these specific things, that would be separate, and it would basically, they would, the board of works would approve that, and then it would be separate. They would just have a special exception. This, it gets confusing because this is a food truck for all purposes, and then the special event permit is separate. But they would, yeah. So I still on there that Beth was going to keep track of the, uh, of the uh, that, and I'm just wondering if she's going to want to do the water and the electric and all that, or is it going to be up to the event? Well, I'm thinking it needs to be 
approved. It's going to be an exception, so it has to go to the Board of Works. It's be approved on application, which um, then you would have to keep track of, which is a question. But anyway, but I mean, are we going to charge any, my, you know, any money? Are we charging anything additional for all these special exception type things, or is it just it's $50? It's $50? Yeah. Uh, it seems to me that we're going to be getting all these special exceptions that we might need to put another fee structure in there because it's going to be a lot of monitoring and yeah, in my opinion there's still work work. for you yeah, yeah. yeah that's administration that's hours yeah. I, I don't find so i don't think you necessarily quite honestly it's not hours. Hours. <laughs> yeah. he said hours not i <laughs> i didn't even say that i feel like that's what and in my opinion i feel like there's still some quirks that need to be worked out i mean i feel like we've got a good base for everything but for best purposes of her time and her Whoever does it, I think we need to think through all the hard questions. There's surely a clean and simple answer to this somewhere. I don't know about you, but I've gotten confused in the last five minutes. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, that was funny. Andy and I were talking about today. I mean, all of like questions kept coming up in my head where I'm like, well, what about this and what about that? And how would you manage this? I mean, I just don't think it's, I would like it to be as clean as we always want it to be, but I think just these have to just be just on, on the application, like if, if we're doing an event um, for the music festival or something like that, and we collect all the applications on, one of the questions on our application is, do you require water and electricity? Can the city just, uh, if they don't require, if it's just a, an arts vendor and they don't require any of that, it's a box. If it's a food vendor that requires water and electricity, it's five bucks. Don't penalize the ones that don't need it. Right. But I'm just a professional. <coughs> yeah. 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 I, I think yeah. it's we can work out that the application simple. in such a way that you don't have to have two yeah. separate applications. That's where it gets really confusing. Yeah. And when we come to present to the board of works, we can say, you know, hey, we're, yes, we need electric, which we know we will. We need water, yes, we know we will. Um, and then we'll collect those fees, and then you know we can. We've been charged before by the previous administration for water and electric, so I assume we would get something from you guys too. I don't know why that would change. So well you got some vendors that self contained. You got their own generators and that, so you gotta kinda of take that into account. Correct. Well I think this presupposes, if I'm speaking correctly, Andy, that this presupposes that this would provide the opportunity for free trucks inside of an event or outside of that correct so that's what this separate ordinance is so if the separate ordinance is for individuals who would be putting a food truck outside of some event that one of the said individual organizations is making so okay so yes okay. i don't think it's in a rush <coughs> uh, all right anybody any other comments or questions about that I'm going to move Monica up to the top of new business. Any other old business that I'm not aware of? Monica's got foot issues, so if you would like to go ahead and make a presentation so you can go put your foot up, we'll, we'll let you. Well, as many of you already know, I'm the chairman for the American Regions of New Fireworks, and I coordinate it, and I've done it for several years. Um, I started doing it before COVID even kicked in. And then during the year of COVID, we still had the fireworks and everybody was glad because everybody wanted to get out of their house, get out. Um, the fireworks has gone up in price in the last three years. And typically all the years before, the city has paid for half of the fireworks and the rest come from other businesses and private donations, even private citizens. So my request is just for the city to continue with the 50% donation towards the cost of the fireworks. The cost has gone from 10000 to 13000 So instead of it being a 5000 donation, it would be 6500 Well, we used 6000 last year, the year before we gave $6,500. So. Okay. Okay. Um, and that is on the 5th? Yes, it is. It is on Friday the 5th. <coughs> Um, in, in respect and in courtesy to Akron, because Akron does their big birthday, you know, besides just the 4th of July, the town of Akron's birthday is the 4th. 
I had a lot of calls for a while there. I didn't know it was on the third or the fifth, and then I finally got kind of <coughs> and that's what I've been telling people lately. It is the fifth, yes. I'll make and a motion to donate the $6,500 to the Legion and uh, the FW and everybody that's involved in that with the fireworks. Second. American Legion. Just the just Legion. There we go. I'll second. We have moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. Aye. There you go. Thank you. Put your foot up. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jeff, you kind of jumped over the stormwater fees. I, I, I did. Just and to I, I'm going to table that for a minute. We're going to, yeah, Brian and I talked about it. We're going to push that forward again. Okay. I just need to get a few minutes. Thank you. Okay. Um, Jeff, you kind of jumped over the I was approached about wanting to look at chickens in town again. Um, Amy's got some sample ordinance that I looked at with her that uh, uh, I'd like for this council to look at over the next 30 days. Also, there's a permit application, I believe, as well. I'd like for this council to look over um, and not make any decision tonight. Does anybody want to speak up about the chicken um, permission? Uh, Permit uh, request that's here tonight. Okay. What I'll about speak. rabbit? Yes. Um, because my grandson won't sleep, I guess he's shy. Um, I moved from the country to the town in 2014, and we had poultry, we had rabbits, goats, everything out there. And I just can't see why this town won't allow poultry into town. Uh, Carmel even allows poultry into their town. Um, you can set regulations, have a permit, make sure they have uh, good housing. Um, I mean, all that can be governed, I guess. I mean, you give citations for not cutting the lawn, you can give citations for chickens not having a house in it, it all can be governed. But he shows uh, poultry in 4-H, and there's several kids that could that show poultry in 4-H. It's just, uh, I don't know, it'll get kids out maybe, maybe some kids in, in town, maybe the parents will allow them to have four chickens. I don't think four chickens should be the limit in this town. It's a rural uh, town, but I think it would be good for, for the town. And eggs are better if they're um, from four chickens in your backyard. Right now, I take them every day out in the country to take care of his chickens. We wouldn't have to do that if it was permitted. Thank you. I'm kind of indifferent on my view on this. Um, I do feel like very strongly one way though, as far as a, uh, and I may mention this to the council, uh, that even as a farmer, when I raised pigs, I had to look, I had to get permission if I wanted to expand my hog operation with my adjoining neighbors even if they were a mile away, I had to get permission. Um, I think, and I feel a lot of nuisance calls in my position as mayor. Um, I think it's something that this council should consider uh, if we do this to, to uh, put in there um, that your adjoining neighbors should sign off on that and say, hey, well, I'm okay with so-and-so having chickens next door to me. Um, the reason that being, um, if we get a call from an adjoining neighbor saying, hey, they're, they're causing trouble, well, you signed off on it. Uh, if you have not the best relationship with your neighbors, having chickens is not going to help that. So um, that is one thing I would consider this, or ask this council to consider as part of it, if they want to consider this at all. Um, because I do think it's, um, when you live in town, you have to be conscious of your neighbors, no matter where you live in town. If you've got somebody living right next door, you have to be respectful of them, and I think that is a good gesture to do. If I'm going to, um, if, if, if we pass an ordinance saying you can have chickens, it has to be contingent upon your neighbor signing off on it. And that's my opinion. Anybody <laughs> have anything they want to share about that or thoughts on that? I think for the, I was checking, catching up 
on my city email and I was looking through and there are 12 references to people talking about chickens, believe it or not, just currently, which I thought was fascinating. And they ranged everything from mayors, city council, town council, town manager, court treasurers, court code enforcement officers, judges. So these individuals are discussing, and that's where I found these two ordinances that I printed off because I thought if this is a discussion, these may be sense for it being logical and detailed related to making sure that it's taken into consideration effectively. So the application was the town of Etna Green. She submitted that in this thread and line of discussion as how they keep track of it, stating that the application seems to be helpful. Uh, then the so we know who has the chickens. They have qualifications for six chickens, no roosters, only hens. The one ordinance basically says it goes through every single farm animal and says the city does not approve any of these farm animals. Don't ask about these farm animals except for hens and rabbits, I think. So there's a lot of detail there that I thought you know, this has come up before the city council multiple times. And I think that there's a path to essentially research it and see what makes sense and if it's possible to the last 12 years that I've been around that this has come up, I'm sure Marty will agree with me, we've always, we've always said one thing, you choose where you want to live. Do you want to live in the city? Live in the city. Well, live rural? Live rural. That's hard. I, I mean, farm's great, and I think if you're going to raise chickens, raise goats and horses, you should definitely uh, move to the country. But uh, I know I personally, I felt this way since the first time it was brought up many years ago, I, I just don't see a reason for chickens <clears throat> in the city limit. And there was an article that I will have at the next meeting because it's about two weeks ago in Indianapolis store them but they got that they were talking about in the Indianapolis or possibly the Carmel area now, where they were talking about uh, child childhood sicknesses from children five years and under is happening in guess what? In neighborhoods where we have chickens. And it is related to the chickens. I'm not, I can't quote it. I remember when I read that, I thought, this was unbeknownst to me before I knew this was going to be on the council meeting tonight. That where I would have, I would have it for us now, but I will have it at the next meeting. And it was just that, you know, that these, this type of disease just doesn't affect everyone. Uh, but you know, neither does poison ivy or poison oak. Or uh, there's different things. But the only thing is, this could happen uh, and to youngsters. Uh, going to school, passing your yard, coming around, going down the alleyway, playing and playing with the chickens and stuff. You, you don't know, and I, I just think that, that this could be, I know you're going to want to have free range chickens. We did this about three years ago where they were going to have free range chickens. And guess what the neighbors all said? They're in my yard. And then the lady gets mad because the dog goes over and attacks the chicken. Well, you're going to have that. Uh, that's the way I'm standing, but I will, I would like to, I will have that article out of the start. At our next meeting, and then just something for somebody, everybody to think about, something else to throw out there. Well, in the Indiana Board of Health, our Board of Animal Health, that was one of this town manager at Bristol said, it would be important to reach out to them because they have a lot of information, which may be what you were speaking about, to understand the implications of the avian, avian uh, flu and all of the other things that could potentially happen. So I think there's some things to consider related to that. There were folks that were against it, folks that were in favor of it. They were always against the free range chickens. They talked a lot about um, the uh, setbacks and having it in backyards, making sure that they had a specific container that the chickens were in and giving rules. So there's a lot to be, I think, considered related to that. So. Okay, any other discussion on chickens? We'll look at this, uh, what Amy passed out to us. and. Talk about this for a few meetings. Rabbits, someone here specifically for rabbits. Yes. Um, I'm Jennifer Branson. Uh, I once again grew up in the country, moved to town in 2014, uh, and I raised rabbits. Uh, my name is on one of the cages at the Fulton County Fair because I did donate money to them. So I was a 10 year 4 H member. Um, and an FFA member. Okay. 
Anybody want to? So, my thing is, is I would like to bring rabbits into town. Granted, rabbits are a lot quieter than dogs, um, and they are a lot less risky than dogs and animals as they don't carry any diseases. Actually, during my research, they don't carry any. So, my presentation is, my breeds of choice would be the Flemish Giant, which is 14 pounds and over, French Lops, which adults are 11 pounds and over, and then the Mini Satins, which are no more than four and a half pounds for show rabbits. I would like to take them to show, um, open shows. I just went to Columbia City not that long ago um, to look around. And there's also Syracuse, there's quite a few rabbit shows for open. Uh, Fulton County used to host them. Ron Riddle used to have a club at the Fulton County Fair where he did rabbit shows as well. Um, my child does do 4-H. He does have poultry and he does have rabbits. Um, once again, open adult rabbit shows. Once again, to help promote rabbits as beef and sheep shows promote their own species. Um, to help local 4-Hers find a rabbit of their specific breed. Um, as Flemish, French, mini satins are a very common breed, but Flemish and French Lops are a dying breed. And then to breed to the standard of perfection from the ARBA. Um, so I have somewhat talked to Zomi when I called and made this appointment. Um, I would like to look at for housing to purchase a 12 by 16 or bigger building to house the rabbit cages. It will have two windows and two big French barn doors um, in, or in the summer. That way the windows can open and we might have a fan to circulate the breeze. Um, and then maybe possibly, at least in the winter, like straw and maybe a heater. We'll see close enough to where their water source will also be. Um, on page three is the rabbit hutch plan my husband has to build for the bigger breed and our breeding does. And then the second cage is a 36 by 30 by 18. That's for the bigger breeds. Um, that is also a cage idea. And then we have a six stacker uh, by 36 by 30 by 18, which divide that in half um, for the smaller breeds. Once again, we live on the corner of 7th and Pontiac. So we are right by the library. Um, so we would also like to think about putting a privacy fence <coughs> around the area. That way in case a rabbit cage is not closed all the way um, or they lack much out of wood, you know. Um, and the door might need it unlatched too. They're not running around the city limits there within a fence. Uh, and then that fence also gives a chance to pull them out of their cage, get a little pant, a little dog thing, and have them run outside for a little bit. Um, I did an example of what I thought about as a fence. Um, and then the pellets would come from some of the farm stores. I am also looking at the sheds using either someone here in Rochester or down in Peru. Um, so feed would be Timothy hay, treats occasionally, you don't want to overfeed them as their diet is very um, Feeders and waters, sizes depend on the breed once again. And then my care plan would be cages with trays will be emptied once a week. Wire cages to be power washed at least monthly. Cardboard in case to protect the pads of each rabbit foot. Daily, daily food and water. Water more often, especially in the heat. Fan and hot months, and then straw and cold Um, So then my breeding and selling pit land would be no more than 25 to 30 permanent residents, and I don't expect to get up to that high. Um, to sell at open shows and other rabbit trees. Facebook rabbit pages especially more focused on 4-Hers. Babies can start to be sold at eight weeks, just like a dog or cat. Rabbits can have litters of from one to 10. We'll need to come up with a breeding schedule around events, and there would be no selling of rabbits on our property, as 
that seems to be getting a little bit more dangerous. You never know who's coming over. So the pros for rabbits are they're quiet, there's no barking, there's no whining, and there's no meowing. They're low maintenance. They do not require a lot of space. They're intelligent and trainable, just like a dog. And rabbits are clean, and they bathe themselves just like cats. The cons are they are delicate. One wrong move, they can break their back pretty easily. Diet is changing feed, is difficult on their bellies. Scratches and digs, so they'll scratch at their, at wood or carpet. And then a specialized if that required. Um, one emergency I had with one of our rabbits, with one rabbit, was I had to take them to Bobo. That was the closest emergency that, that took rabbits. My vacation plans would be my brother and nephews will help to take care of the rabbits if we decide to leave town for more than a day. If brother is not available, we do have friends. <coughs> so carcasses, for my miscellaneous, the carcasses will be removed immediately upon being seen and then taken to brother's property and then feces, um, even though it's great for fertilizer, it'll be removed like dog and cat. So, and this kind of brings into the topic of poultry in a small way, as all my ordinances are rabbits and poultry. Argus allows rabbits and poultry within their city limits. Um, and so does Bull, Indiana. Uh, I reviewed 85% of the city ordinances on American Legal Publishing. Not all the counties or the cities were there. Most do not mention rabbits. <laughs> if they do, they only mention them being classified as livestock and or fam farm animal or domesticated pet. They do not give limits or advice. I did notice that poultry was brought up numerous times, whether it be yay or nay, there are more rules for them. Um, so something I had seen, poultry right here, uh, these are the big cities that allow poultry. That didn't have anything to do with mine. However, USDA has classified rabbits as the poult, so they are not under the same meat guidelines as beef and pig, as rabbits that USDA doesn't have to approve any of them. Um, and the definition that I found of livestock is anything that is to be used for meat, fur, or wool, my rabbits or breeding. Some definitions have the word breeding in it. But if we use breeding, then dogs and cats are labeled as a livestock animal as well. Um, my next thing was processing. The, as I said, USDA specifies rabbits are not classified as livestock. Rabbits are exempted from USDA inspections on slaughter. Grades for rabbit meat are removed in 1995. And that came from the USDA website. And then once again, here are my Argus and my wool um, standards from their personal city ordinances. All right. Yep. Here's my suggestion. You just got it. I'm going to get over the next 30 days, bring it up the next week. And we'll make the decision in the order. If I, if I may, I don't think you're asking, there, we don't have anything that limits rabbits, but the part of our ordinances that I think she's talking about is that limits the number of pets. Number of animals. Yeah. See, and when I called about the ordinances, because zoning said they would not, when I mentioned a rabbit going into the shed, they said no. So our ordinance is a household can't have more than five pets, five animals. Okay. I think where, where the exception would, it, would have to be is our ordinance specific, specifically says no more than three dogs and no more than five total animals per house. Unless you get a permit, correct? Right. Is how I read it? Right. So there's nothing about rabbits whatsoever? No. Just guys. There's nothing that no. Yeah, I, I think the main ordinance topic here is the number of animals. So it's not the approval of rabbits being yeah. there. I don't think we have anything that says you can't have rabbits. No, the only, the only other thing is if, is if someone uh, classifies rabbits as a 
on the animal, they would by default be outside of the right. I think it would have to be mm -hmm. one of those two. Now, I want to be clear. Um, uh, you're asking about the city ordinances, not zoning rules. Okay. A change to uh, a zoning exception does not happen in front of the city council. Okay, well, zoning didn't say that, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As I said, I just barely started. That's fine. No, that's fine. Here. I just, I just wanted to be clear up front, so um, just so that's a different, different process as well. Yeah. Okay, now I'm in clear. So, so in other words, is she going for the zoning board or what? If she is asking for more than five pets, then, uh, then, then uh, you or I don't remember if it says the point the uh, city council. Uh, we did that. Yeah. It's not. But okay, the, the city council do that. If, if she's asking for any other restriction, because there, there may be some other restriction that's in the zoning code that prevents her from having rabbits, it doesn't have anything to do with the number of animals. I'm just saying so we can to, we can change the one but not the other. Right. So she needs to check more thoroughly with the zoning. Just just to be sure. Uh, to, you know, <coughs> it, I, Heather's not here. If she said, well, yeah, the zoning ordinance doesn't allow rabbits because X, then nothing the city council does is going to change that uh, short of uh, going through another round of modifying the zoning ordinance, which we get fairly recently. So, so is that the Rochester or is that the area of planning The area of planning commission is chiefly involved in a change of the zoning ordinance, but all the municipalities <laughs> have input into that. Yeah, if it's just a variance, from the rule, or a special exception to the rule, but she just wants a variance, that would be in front of the Rochester today. Okay. That's what I, I thought she was today. She's just unable to come this evening. So I would, I would dig further with them and see yeah. what's... Well, then I think we also, because what the zoning said was farming. And I don't think anybody has a definition of what a farming is. Because if you Google it, Google definition of a farming animal. It's anything with four legs. There's your dogs and cats. Um, then also, if you do a farm animal and you're thinking of breeding, there's your dogs and cats. <laughs> then if you also thought about um, these rabbits would not be for me, not in my hands. They would not be fur or wool. And those are those are all. Arguments that can be made to the to the BZA if you're looking for a zoning exception. But I think for this board to consider this month, the question is: Are you asking them to let you have more than more than five pets? Okay, then that's the part they need to chew on between now. And next month. All right, very good. I have one question with that um, ordinance with just five pets. I know houses have maybe 12 or 15 cats in their house, so it's not, it's just what people see. But there's also part of that ordinance that you could get a kennel license if you want to breed dogs. So is there a license that you can get a, for a rabbit tree to breed rabbits? I don't have an answer for that. Um, this specific ordinance just talks about the number of animals that you can have and if you want to go beyond that, you need permission from the city council. Right. So if rabbits are allowed in town, then for her to get more than five, because we have, well, more than two, because we've got two cats and a dog, then, um, where was I heading with this? Uh, we would need a permit. Yeah, all we would need is a permit then. A breeder's permit, at least according to the state of Indiana. But in the ordinance, it just says kennel, which refers mainly to dogs. I know, I, I'm not talking about a kennel license or a kennel or a breeder's license. I'm just talking strictly the number of animals in a house. Okay. But what I'm saying is that there is a permit that you can get in town a kennel license for dogs. And I'm just saying that there's an exception that can be had. Now, who would want a kennel? on 7th and Pontiac Street, I mean, but a rabbit tree, they don't make, or rabbits, they don't make noise. Okay, we'll try and, 
We'll try and have a straight uh, forward approach to this before we try to figure out what exactly we need to do going forward. Um, I'm, not, I'm not real, I'm not clear on. I mean, it, it's getting really in a gray area here that's really a mess. So I need to, we need to talk to Andy, we need to talk to the zoning board and find out <coughs> what we need to do going forward on that, okay? So give us some uh, time I'm assuming most of you are here for the nickel plate uh, one-way street on uh, suggestion on Park Street. Uh, I assume you're all here applauding the idea. <laughs> now we're here to answer your questions. We have our engineers been working on it for how many years? <laughs> Five years. Five years. Um, and I, I sent all of you, all of you, I think, received my personal letter to you to kind of explain the options we had on Park Street. I know a couple of you had a question. Mitch uh, Hansel from USI is here to answer any questions you might have on that. So uh, I'm just going to open it up for floor discussion. If, you have, if you're very passionate one way or another, just, you know, we're here to talk. We're not here to yell at each other or make our point too. We're here to just hopefully answer questions you might have. We may still leave here not in total agreement with one another, but uh, at least we aired our feelings and our views. So, does anybody have any questions from the floor that they want to bring up now? I think I have quite a few questions. I live on the corner of 12th and Park. I own the property going to the north to the next parcel, which would be 1103 Park Street. I own to the outside uh, basement door of that property. The whole property is mine. And I share it with my dad. He lives at 1103. Uh, he uses I personally, on the one-way thing that was proposed to go both ways with me, I mean, I'm on the corner, I can go wherever. He uses 12th or Park Street to the south daily, multiple times a day. And I can see nothing more of an inconvenience for him to have to drive down, out around to Wallbash Avenue, back around, to pass my house, which is 150 feet away to go back down 12th Street to get to wherever he's going. Um, we we built there as a family in 1938. And here we sit, having to now travel north, and only north, down which is pretty much a drag strip. Uh, and we were talking to you, uh, Trent, um, earlier. The speeding traffic does come down, come from north to south quite a bit. It's when they come off of 12th Street, traveling east, and they hit Park Street, you'll, you'll just hear them. They'll just nail the gas and see how fast they can get to the bottom of the hill to, to 10th Street. Uh, somebody's going to get hit there. It's, I mean, this is going to be inevitable. Uh, and I, my, we don't even let my child, who's 13, play, mess around even with his buddies in any of that area. Like, it just, it's just too dangerous. Um, if he is going to go out to the street, even at 13 years old, I walk, I go out to the street with him and make sure that it's safe for him to get on 12th Street, not on Park Street, just on 12th Street, and go to Wallbash and then take it to the stoplight, cross at the stoplight there. I've seen too many, too many things, too many close calls. I can't say I've ever seen any bad accidents on 9th Street where Park comes to, you know, comes to an end there, comes with a T, but it is a blind corner. Uh, we would never let him cross there. I, would, I mean, even if there was a walking trail, he would never use said walking trail. Um, just too dangerous. Been there too many years. I've lived in that house at 1103 Park Street since 1987. Um, and we couldn't even as kids really play on that, on that street because of the traffic and the craziness. But the inconvenience of my father, the next door neighbor, and the colleagues across the street we all travel, they all travel south on that street to get to where they're going. Not have to go back through town or however to get to anything south of town. There's nothing, I can't say there's nothing to the north side of town if they want to go to, but you know, it's just a, it's a crazy inconvenience. And uh, the only reason I'm saying this is I'm kind of in the dark. Three weeks ago was the first that I heard of this when I received the letter that this was even going on. In my mind, the first thing I said was, why would the trail ends? At Wallbash Avenue, why are we not going down Wallbash Avenue to a stoplight, to a crossing, 
to the trail that we're ultimately trying to get to, and we're going to re we're going to readjust everything on the street um, and everybody's lives, their parking, their everything as they come and go on a daily basis to make it so I'm not opposed to the walking trail. Why why are we just not hearing it's going down our street and there's you know there's there what in our minds there's other options, safer options, uh, you know um, cars coming down up and down 12th Street. We have a 20 mile an hour zone. Your first sign when you turn on to 12th Street off of Wabash Avenue is past my house across the tracks at College Avenue. That's your first 20 mile an hour sign. People turn there and we've seen literally seen people drag race down. And I, and I talked with uh, Ed one night. I said, can you please just stop by some morning, sit in my yard, back in the yard, because it's crazy. The cars, how they go up and down. And my fear is, on that, I know I'm jumping from back and forth here on a lot of different things, but my fear is there, if the, the trail's gonna cross 12th Street, you better stop the traffic and not slow it up. Um, it's, it's, it's cra it gets crazy there. And, and no, no fault to anybody, you couldn't control it enough. You know, uh, it's, it, it's just, I, I actually talked with Tom Butler about four years ago, because there was a volunteer that was driving, he would come past our house, um, and I mean, when I say as hard as his truck would go, as hard as his truck would go. And so we, it, Tom settled it. I mean, it was, it, Tom handled it in the right way. And I, you know, nobody was yelling and screaming, but it was just one of those deals of this truck's going by. I know he's trying to get someplace urgently. I get it, but at, at what expense? You know, and, and my kid or somebody else's kid or anything out the street when this is going by. Tom had that fixed and it never, you know, it didn't happen again. I greatly appreciated it. But the, the, the trail, great, love it. I love the fact that if it comes from, uh, what are we gonna call it, uh, 18th Street, I don't know if it's 18th or Mitchell or whatever it is there, over to, to 12th Street, that <coughs> there, love it. My kid, he has a couple friends that live along the trail across the way. He can jump on on his bike, go down there, it's safe, and there's, no, there's never anything crossing there, then we just have to worry about it crossing on uh, 18th Street, or I don't know if it's 18th Street or Mitchell Drive or whatever that is there, but anyway. And then he can then go on down the trail from there. Down the Park Street, I still, I would never even have him use it. Um, I, we would still get him over to Wabash Avenue and get him to the stoplight and let him cross there. That's what he did today to go to the park, to the pool. You know, he, he went, 12th wall bash across because we just don't that that blind corner it's it's narrow there i mean i've been sitting there in a vehicle turning to get on the park street and just know that i was going to get creamed by a semi coming at me because it's just not a lot of room and to have him cross there to get to whatever in the middle and then to cross on there to me it's just a, it's a dangerous situation and i just don't feel that somebody there's a lot of room to get hurt there you know and then just the disrupt the disturbance of us, not me, my dad and whoever lives on Park Street there, they have no access to the to the, the south. Everything would have to be via town, Ninth Street, or back out and around the giant block to get where you just started. You know, it's a it's a small it's a small strip. You know, so I guess we're just kind of wanting wanting to know like what where we stand on that and what we can do. Why the other yeah, I don't think anybody is against anything. It's just Mitchell, a lot of confusion. Mitchell will address your question on wall back here in a second. I, and first thought was, I don't know why, so I, I thought we were able to take that one way south. But then when I talked to Mark McCall and I got a letter of support from him on this. He was involved in our uh, redevelopment commission from the beginning of this project, I believe. But, um, he said we could do one way north and be better because of the traffic that typically comes off night and zooms down Park Street going south. So that would make better sense. It was it would create a much more quiet Park Street from 12th to 9th by going one way north. But I totally get the inconvenience in your your on much brought up on my property. If, you, if you're familiar with with the, the corner there, yeah, I have a steep hill. It's a grass hill. We've had cars hit that hill coming across the tracks, hit the hill, ricochet, and go. 
Yeah, how many times is that crossing been that's hit? Not, it's that's in the middle of the street. <laughs> we have cars hit that I mean, it's been hit, I don't know how many times. They didn't even put it back, though. No. <laughs> yeah. It just, just got hit recently. It, 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 it's, now, I understand that that can all come out, but also then, the, you know, it, it's just so hectic right there on that corner. That it, that's, that's, my, that's our concern, one, is, is that. The only way I can see to slow the traffic is to stop the traffic. Is by you know bringing them to a stop at some point because my, my mom always said the reason why people come down 12th Street so fast is their last stop is at Monroe Street. Mm -hmm. Now we got a straight shot all the way to Wabash Avenue. We're, we're going for it. Yeah. Um, I've seen, like I said, both ways. I've seen them want two cars line up at, at Monroe Street and drag race to the tracks, and I've seen two cars stop and come across us. Just and it's just crazy. Now, does that happen all the time? No, and it, it, it can happen anywhere. As far as people doing that, people are idiots driving anyway. But in my eyes, no. The slow the traffic is to the, the stop the traffic. And even on Park Street, the slow the traffic would be to stop the traffic at some point, to where they can't just use that as a, a thoroughfare to get to wherever they're going. Because it seems like they're just they're cutting. They're trying to beat something whatever it is to get to the next to 9th Street or trying to beat something to get to 12th Street to Main Street. You know. And I'm probably as just as guilty as anybody else of doing that on a different street. Mitch. You're up, man. <laughs> <laughs> Again, Mitch is our engineer at work on this for ever and looked at a lot of different options and you answer your questions. Yes, so um, I apologize. Um, we were originally going to go along the uh, urban property and um, had route to go all the way up to um, uh, Ninth Street uh, along the railroad, but then the businesses um, along Ninth Street had issues with additional pedestrian okay. traffic, etc., um, going along their businesses, and so um, they really opposed that we would have to acquire property from them and so that just unfortunately didn't happen. So then we looked at Wall Action 12th Street and um, the issue with it being a DNR grant is you have to have um, protection for bicyclists is the main thing. And so we would have had to put the wind meter posts along all of 12th Street, kind of in that shoulder area on the south side to protect um, you know eight year old kids uh, biking along the street. And then to come up on Wabash Street, we were looking at beyond the west side, so that you didn't have to cross Wabash Street. And we would have had to have widened the sidewalk five foot into the grass, but we still would have been too close to 12th Street. We wouldn't have had that five foot buffer that we need for bicyclists to get out of control and get off the trail. So we would have had to kind of put fencing or something all along that west um, side of Wabash Street to keep bicyclists out of Wabash Street. And then the worst part was the intersection there <coughs> where, the, um, where the lights at. You've got elevation differences, so it's almost impossible to get wheelchairs up to um, the uh, ADA ramps. And then it's a wide intersection <coughs> um, for people to be able to cross. And then we would have had to have added pedestrian signal heads and some other things to protect protect pedestrians as they cross and there was just a lot there that wasn't sightly would have been opposed by all the property owners on Wabash Street and um, uh, just we didn't think was the safest route for um, students, kids and uh, citizens in general. So <clears throat> Park Street is the more direct route. We were originally looking at a sidewalk along Park Street and just letting the bicycle keep it a two-way building the sidewalk on Park Street and letting the bicyclists uh, share the road and the pedestrians walking along the sidewalk. <coughs> we do have a crossing along 9th Street. We will have a median barrier in the middle lane of 9th Street. Um, the inlet has blessed it, um, so the kids only have to cross 12 feet, sit, look to the right, <coughs> go another 12 feet, and then get on their way. Um, but half the reason I was the sidewalks and the mayor came up with this one-way route so that we can <coughs> have a 12-foot lane, again, that goes north only. We would have a, um, what we call a milk shoulder corrugation, <coughs> similar to what you see on US 31. We'll get off the roadway and shake you. And 
and so they have them now that they don't make so much noise, but it would shake somebody who would get off towards the trail to let them know that they need to <clears throat> veer back right onto the roadway. And uh, we'd have a big white strike there, but the main thing is to <clears throat> try and separate the bicyclists and the pedestrians from the traffic. Um, Park Street is a lot, I guess, slower, I would think, than what Wabash Avenue or 12th Street is. Um, and again, a safer route from what we can see, and um, <clears throat> a lot less traffic than what you have on the other two roads. Um, we were looking at potentially a stop sign at 10th Street to get them to stop at 10th, and then continue north. Um, that's still a possibility if we can do the traffic study. And, um, it's allowable, but um, we can look into some, it's going to be a 12-foot lane. You're not going to feel comfortable going really fast um, in that narrow lane, but uh, obviously people might try. Are there stop signs a possibility there on 12th Street on each side of the trail for traffic, east and west, or is that not a possibility? You would have to do a study. That's like you have to have a study down the park. Yeah. Yeah. Would that be related when you have to go through the railroad go? Question. If they start queuing up, along. but the river doesn't cross past 12th Street. So it goes across 12th Street. Yeah, yeah it does. It goes all the way to the trailhead right now. Yeah. 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 They have a lot of colors. No, they do. Uh, they do. Yeah, they got some. Yeah, they got some. Yeah, they got some. Yeah, they got some. And the siding is really wide there. Once you go from 12th to 9th, yeah. it's a dual. It's, it's really bright. Yeah. And it, it widens out all the way to 9th. Yes, yeah, so the issue would be from 18th to 12th. I'm not sure how wide you have to play with So I I know I've got me and Trent talked a little bit. With me coming out of there with 18 wheelers out of those buildings, I can't go to the north, especially if you put a barrier in the middle of the road and ever make that corner. Because I I come back to the south <coughs> to come back around to Walmash because I can't make, I mean, it's, it's almost, I almost can't make it coming to the south, you know, with the, with the semis. But that's his own commercial property in there. So if I'm bringing semis in and out of there, now we made a suggestion, maybe a, an exemption or something to come to the south. Right. But um, that's, that's my concern with that. And going across 14, that is a suicide mission across Park Street. Because them coming around that curve mm -hmm. is a tough one. Yeah, yeah. Yep. I can I can only say that my kid will never cross that. He'll cross it. He'll cross it. Even if there's a barrier in the middle, it's going to be tough. Yeah. Have they not done traffic studies? You said you said we'd have to do for the stops. And, and have you done traffic studies like on how much traffic goes on Park Street? How busy um, We haven't. You, sh you should. It's busier than what you think. I think that you don't realize how many people that through there. Every time I was driven there, parked Well, we lived there. Then I'm 48 years old. I, I grew up there. My, my grandparents built that house. I'm telling you, this is busier than what you realize. Yeah. And if I'm, if they had an exemption, why wouldn't he get an exemption? You know, here we go. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's only here. And I understand what he's saying. He is, he is zoned, or he can have that stuff down there. Right. I mean, his need is three times a year. Uh, Regardless if it's... If the problem is, is that is today. You know, if y'all would go in there with some kind of a business, then I'm going to be, I'm going to be screwed. But, but and, and I understand the, the need to the, for the, the uh, bike trail. I understand that. My concern is going across 14. There's a lot of other issues that's going to happen. Some complications for that proposal going down part of the But... You're saying 14th and 9th Street? Yes. 9th Street. Yes. Yes. I mean, that's that's my only concern there. I mean, as far as me getting in and out, yeah, I'm today pretty minimal. And I can I can fight it and get through, you know, with the RV and the bus and, the, and all that. But, I mean, when we hook the car to the RV to the bus, you know, I'm 75 feet long. Jim and I talked about that. He doesn't do it very often, presently anyway. Right. You know, we can have, we can give him a special permit to accommodate the end of the mound with bigger equipment. Uh, but 
you know, by going, if we, if we reverse that one way to south, and I totally get your concern about crossing 9th Street or 1425, uh, but if we reverse that and went south one way, I, I, you're going to get, I, in my opinion, you're going to get a lot more traffic that we to use coming off of 9th Street, going down Park Street, and going south, and you would turn it around. You guys think differently? You think it would be the other way? The other thing then too, if you're gonna if you're gonna divide the we're gonna let's just say we're gonna divide this the street in there. Okay. Everybody on the east side of the road, especially once you get past 10th Street, there's a park on the road. They, that's, that's where they have to park. Even if they're just a tire out on the street, that's where they're parking, which is taking up a couple feet of the street. He has to use my property already to park. And so what, and if anybody wants to come and visit him, it's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a little runoff there to park, yes, but you're still in this, you're still out in the streets. You take in, you take a foot of that away, and now we're now you're putting a car back into the walking path. Yeah. You know, so what are we supposed to do? We have no accommodations for that. And without you know going to great length of tearing up our yards so that somebody can Park so that we can now lose half of our street going for a walking trail, for a walking trail going north. We're in a similar situation. But we live, we're south of, of, sorry, north of Dave here, and there's a unimproved alley or retired alley that runs to the back of the property that allows us for two parking spaces. So even though the alley is not technically an active one and not technically inactive, because the city won't maintain it, um, we only have two parking places. So if you have a situation where you've got a big vehicle or you've got people coming over, street parking is your only <coughs> access. You got a utility pole on the corner, there's no yard parking. So that's a huge issue too. And we're on the east side of the road. <coughs> There's no yes. no parking. Well, there's no parking on the street. <laughs> but nobody parks there. It. No, I mean on that on that particular street, it's two-way traffic. Yeah. And there should not be anybody parking on the street. Now they do, but they shouldn't. Yeah. That's my point. There's not they enough for oh, well, yeah. I'm just saying there's not supposed to. Be. <laughs> I'm not saying what they're done. There's not a sign down that says no parking nope. on that street. Either side. Very <laughs> parking on the side would have to be prohibited by ordinance. No, I'm not saying they can't park along the side. They're just not supposed to have be on yeah, the Yeah, there's yeah, they're saying that they're one wheels in the street, one's on the grass. Because it, it that's the reason I don't come from the north yeah, of the yeah, semis sure. because yeah, I understand your point. Yeah, I understand yeah, your point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I drove a truck there ain't no way yeah. I'd want to make that turn down there. Yeah. No matter if there's a barrier down there or not. Yeah. That's why people don't have anywhere to go. Yeah. Their, their house is right at the street. They can't yeah. help that. And that's, what, that's why we didn't like the sidewalk idea on the west side. Yeah. That was going to take all yeah. parking you know, away from you on that side of the road. Yeah. And it was going to be tremendously expensive. Oh, yeah, I, just, exactly. I wouldn't have liked it if I were you and lived on the west side. That's when I came up with the one way idea. Yeah. Like, well, years ago, years ago, we tried to get a sidewalk put in. Well, I'm, I'm talking back in the early 90s. Down through there, we, my my uncle lives at the on the west side, side. On, the, on the on west the west side. Years ago, my yeah. uncle. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we couldn't have that because of drainage. Yeah. Because there's no place to drain because it would it, would, it goes across my yard. It would yeah. Push it back yeah. Out. yeah. 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 Always has. She, yeah. She's the poorest hole to get to. Yeah, that's exactly right. You're the wetland. There's no <laughs> grain. There's no grain on that street at all. Nowhere. It, so it just goes to nat natural leaf. Yeah. It just, it, it just, and so if we had curbs and sidewalk back then, this is this is the city engineer wouldn't allow it. It went through a bunch of stuff. Yeah. So that got dropped years ago to be able to do that because the water would have no place it would. It would divert it back out into the street, then we have a flood situation there, and it's one of the lowest spots in, in town, one of the lowest elevations in town, so everything so, would collect there. So explain to me on the street can have a rumble strip and not a curb versus the sidewalk on wall by <coughs> to be five feet off the street. So 
So how how are we going to allow five feet from the passing traffic to the walking path? This portion of the trail isn't funded by the DNR. It's a different fund. Okay. All right. All right. So that we're not funding yeah. for the DNR. Right. We've got the running strips. Again, for the safety, for the traffic. Right. And well, I was, I was trying to figure out how right. how it was passable on Park Street, but not on Park Street. So who takes care of that if not funded? Who does fund it? Yeah. It's being funded by Enda. Okay. So they maintain it, they clean it. No. Strips per se are a barrier. You can drive over. The well, yeah. The, the, that the barrier is the problem with the right. semi because of the low boy. I can't get across a barrier when I'm carrying it four inches off the ground. Right. And the bus is bus is eight inches. I mean, I can get across the barrier, but I can't the semi. You know. So if you do the street, there, you're not putting curbs and all that down through there, right? No. You're not doing. You're not widening the street or nothing. You're just putting a rumble strip. Yeah, and, that's, right. and, and I don't have necessarily have the problem with with the street in the one way, but you know, getting across how how that's going to work. I don't. I don't see how that center section is going to get so across. Yeah, Fort 19 or 9th Street, 14. Oh, the, the, the pedestrian yeah. across. That's that's my yes. Mm -hmm. I don't see how that I I really see a light is not going to work. Is that still where it's going to be across, or like the old Rochester Deli is? is that no. Still no. Where no. Last fall, I was at the nickel plate meeting and was told it was all in place and we were going to extend that railroad. This spring, it was starting, and then. The way they were going to connect to the city trail. So how are you planning on connecting to the city trail now? Where are you coming from? I don't know the name of these streets. Sure. Um, so Park Street, we're going to go to the west. Park Street. Uh, that's 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 out the petition. Comes out. Yeah. Comes Nubianos. Nubianos. Yes. Yeah. In between Nelson's and Nubianos. Right? Okay. Yes. There's so, oh, okay. Nubianos. Okay. And then you're going to go straight across here to the old field over there, correct? Correct. On 9th Street. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll across Ray Street. Yeah. Yeah. Along Ray Street. There's a walking trail right there. Yeah. yeah. It's only money, but I was down in Arkansas last fall, and their park system, they run every trail under the federal fares that aren't controlled. Yeah. I mean, they, they claim one lawsuit was paid for. So they build the tunnel, the walking path goes under every thoroughfare that isn't controlled. Just like up in the middle. There's no slowing down, no stopping. They run everything under the railroad well, tracks. Well, it's a problem in Peru on Street. There would be a crossing line. You'd have the signs. And then, yes, I was just wondering about that. Yeah, it's safe. Not on that curve. I mean, that is something They were told me they were going to take it out because that's all the general revenue. Oh, yeah. I might as well. I'm going to take it out one way or another. Well, everybody else has to go out. Wait a little bit. Somebody hit it again. What was it? Two, three weeks ago? Somebody hit it. In a pickup truck. How did you hit that thing? You know, 
Just there all around the year and all that. Come by, put it back up. Yeah, they got there. Stop by the ground. in the way and what and, and because then you're talking you know from down there you're talking the the, the bank you're talking the uh, post office you're talking you know all of these other other things and, and, and we did walk Wabash and Wabash is a very narrow street already busier than Park Street okay and and then you want to cross to where that light is already at so which side of Wabash do you want to adjust? Well, it'd be really smart to be on the on the east side. Well, oh, golly gee, do you know that that's where all the all the, all the fire, hydrant, fire hydrants are? Okay, so now to meet the criteria of what is called a, a path, a bike path, which is 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 not 
you know, a sidewalk is not this and is not that. It was like, I mean, we really struggled. So it's not like as if this is something that, that I mean, any any ideas. I mean, if we can put parks, if Park Street needs to go the one way, the other direction than what we're thinking, and that would make everybody's life so much easier. Oh, why not? If that's the only only thing that's an issue, please let us know that that's, that's it. Not that's not but, true. No. but it, it, you got another idea. I mean, because now what has happened since then is that the railroad is purchased now. Okay? So that's a whole nother issue. Okay, now we don't have a vacant railroad or a railroad that is just, you know, barely used. That, that railroad is purchased. So now the, the people that purchase that railroad has a different criteria than, than when it started years ago. So, yeah, it'd be nice to know, when, you know, is, is there another path? Not, not, not really because of crossing 9th Street to get it to the other side to connect. And, and reality is, is it's all a, a, a nicer way to live in Rochester uh, is, is ultimately the attempt so, by everybody. So, so we're going to move the fire hydrant at the end of Park Street to do this. Not the fire One fire hydrant. hydrant's a lot better than four. There's four, four there's four fire hydrants on the corner of Wall no, It's not the corner. It's coming down 12th okay. Street and coming down. And there's a bunch of utilities on, on, on that side and everything else that's also affected. happened that I realized that oh you know what it was changed so why not part why would, would that be an answer for you guys that live there it is to not allow me to just go down there for the heck of it unless I'm coming to visit you you know you know and and are you going to change the bus route Sure. I mean, you can do some things. I mean, you can do some signage. I would picture it anyway. You can do some signage. Do some things way. that make sense to them possible. I'm just, I'm just trying to make out some yeah. of so, yeah. so, the question yeah. I've got yeah. is <laughs> the alley to the east, uh, Park Street. Yes. Yes. That's exactly what I was going to say. So, we discussed that, but the optimist <laughs> doesn't want to go by theirs. They only are there seasonally. Yeah. And that could so, be so a then, have you have you looked into that? We looked at that. So, you've got what, maybe a 10 foot wide alley. Yep. And so, if a car is coming down there, <coughs> there's nowhere for a bicycle to, to go. Right. To go. Could you, you jump could, in? Could you don't make it, it'll be in traffic. So then we're eliminating access to the house. The people who use access to the alley for the mm -hmm. is real. So yeah, there are three houses. So what, can we give them a special attention? Um, is there any way to police that? I don't have a big issue with the runaway street as much as I got with the kids crossing over Pine yeah. Street. Yeah. I, I got a big problem with them crossing that with no light because somebody will get it. Sit down there one time <laughs> and watch you come around that curve there. I got I get more number one symbols when I come out of that street than anybody else. Could just be you. Well, I'm I'm gonna park it right in the middle of the street one of these days. That's right. We have designed that crossing to be as safe as possible. 
Okay, the, the issue is, again, safety. And so if concerned about traffic racing down Park Street, and my concern is if we keep it two way and those traffic is still racing down Park Street, and we have kids walking along there on a bike on along there, that's not as safe as if we only have one lane and we're regulating where they're at and these kids have eight to nine foot to get away from that traffic to walk. Do you know which way that bus goes on that street? Do you know which way the bus goes? No. That goes there every day. It don't go that way like you want the one way to go. It comes this way. But so now you're switching the bus I've had semis come down 10th Street. They can't turn north. I have to move my car so they can turn south. <laughs> is that you? <laughs> yep, you know who it is now. <laughs> okay. But I, I don't think it's you. This they're trying to go north. No. Trying to go north? Yeah, yeah. off a of tent. Yeah, they I can't make it because of the poles and the fire hydrants. Well, I got a 50 foot float away and it's actually in the back and I gotta have her all because they can be getting the lines away. I will do it off the end and don't do that over at me. Okay, we need to, we got a couple more things to cover. Uh, Mitch, where are we and what, what needs to happen? Yeah. Um, I know we talked to Jody. Right. And she said the very latest we can have a vote on this or approval to this. <coughs> Move the project forward would be a month from now at our next meeting. Uh, I don't typically, I'm against doing three readings at one night. You have to have a unanimous decision by all of us to approve something. Uh, so I just talked to Brian. Here's my suggestion, uh, and I, I, I don't think there's any way we're going to make a decision that's going to be <laughs> make everybody happy. Um, but tonight we do two readings of this ordinance to, to uh, approve the one way north have the third reading and the, the vote four weeks from now we will consider any I, I don't know what we can consider but we've looked at every other option we're about to kill this project it's what we're looking at or we'll have to have further discussion so i don't think anybody wants the project killed no, no i don't think no, that's not true, really not saying yeah, I'm, no. just, I'm just trying to no. figure out what what you know and this gives us a <coughs> to have more discussion with you guys, and I'm open to having a meeting with all of you, and we'll bring as many as we can in to listen to, you know. It feels like it's set in stone, though. It feels like we're, we're just fighting against stuff. Well, uh, the, problem, the problem is I'd love to have another option for you. Yeah. <laughs> I really would. Uh, well, just so, tell us that. If it's pointless for us to come here and, and give us your... Our, our opinion. Just tell us that, so we won't well, I, keep rattling here. And, and we, we, came up, we came up with a new idea two weeks ago, so I'm not saying we <clears throat> we can't come up with another idea. I'm just saying that I don't want to railroad this through. I, you know what I'm saying? Uh, <laughs> so have we looked at widening the alley to the east? Right away, there's not enough right away. I'm just trying to. I'm just trying to think. Please talk about that. And I, I, I understand your concerns, and, and I understand the one way and having to go around that I completely understand that. And we would be more than happy to look at a stop sign at 10th Street. We'd be more than happy to look at a um, stop sign on 12th Street. By 12th Street, yeah. Street. We'd be more than happy to look at um, even um, so monitors or, or, I'm sorry, um, how big of an issue is this yes. having an exemption to go to the I don't think it'd be a board of works thing. I, as we've talked about, you know, like a local <laughs> and the other the other thing I mentioned to you was, you know, you had him on speed dial or texted me, hey, I'm gonna go get the one way here today. With him. Right. You know, and just so we know. Right. Uh, yeah. Just just a courtesy call. Right. Basically, that would be the other thing. But uh, it, yeah, I wish there was. <clears throat> I really wish there was another another option. But I've. I've only been involved in these meetings since June of last year, and I know how difficult it's been to try and come up with a plan that, and this is absolutely the last option we have. Right? Well, but, but except for the free for all into the 12th Street and let people. So I don't like that. I, I honestly agree with everyone that it's not this. No word, no matter where you put it across 9th Street, yeah. it's, it's going to be safe. I believe they look at going over the top. But here's the other thing: I come down 350 <laughs> South in the town from. from 
I come up from the south, I turn on 31 to 350, and I zoom across that path at 45, 50 miles an hour. Now there's stop signs for the bikers and for the walkers, but if they don't obey them, I'm going to nail them. Yeah. So there's a lot of safety issues from here to Kokomo and South Kokomo. Where the trail goes, there's a lot of safety issues in a lot of different places. So 9th Street isn't going to be unique in that at all. Well, I'm, I'm just telling you, there's a lot of traffic. I, I, I totally get that. Yeah, I totally that, get that. that baby is. I'm, I'm telling you. And I think, it's and I been think more than once. I think we're going to have to really look at a lot more alert signage on each side of that. So what we're going to do tonight we're going to do two readings. We'll vote on this in four weeks, and it may not pass. I mean, we're going to listen to you, I mean, but we're going to look at the options um, that we talked about as far as signage and, and extra stop signs in different places and so forth. That was not in our thought process before you guys came tonight. So I appreciate you bringing the alertness to us on the, the speed on 12th Street and the other issues. Uh, so. Mitch will work on what we can do to make it as good as we possibly can. But I hate to kill a project. We've got a lot of net, a lot of money invested. Uh, USI is taking a lot more money on this one here. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love throwing other people over the bus. <laughs> I, no. I do have one question for all you guys, though. If the one way went the other way, would you feel that better or worse? Is that better or worse? I don't think. I don't think. I think that's. That's neither here nor there. No. Okay. Obviously, it's no. Well, I appreciate it, but no, I don't think that. It, that, that I'm the only one. I'm the only one that's going to be affected. And yeah, I'm not. Yeah, I, I mean, he's the only one. I got yeah. tractors and stuff in. Well, it. and I but. just felt like that one way south was going to cause a lot more people to turn off the night and speed. And, and it, it, it will. will. Which forced it will. Will. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And as for somebody that's used the trail with children and with a dog, and on rollerblades, okay? If I was to come up at that spot, personally, what I would do is say, what kind of fool made this design? And I would go down to the stop. Yeah, exactly. and I would personally yeah, go down Yeah, because to it's a wider street. And, and use the light because my child is <coughs> young. Yeah, I understand that works. I really would. Yeah. She's going down the hill. Okay, I, I, but we don't down. have it. Yes any yes, other option up, no. as to why because even that path when we walked with the dnr guy that knows all the rules and all the regulations because we did try even temporary even car it was like ah, it can't work because of the width because of of that that code that you have to stay in which trust me we were like are you serious um you know and I would. I would look at that light and say, it's only a few more blocks. Let's go down there and let's cross. And we're on the same path we're attempting to get on. Right. I, I mean, I would. Um, as a parent that, that cared about. So, so with this all being said, if you're me, or you have to vote on it by the next meeting, to, to stay when, when is this going to go? <coughs> into, when is this going to go in effect? Or what? The construction, the construction timeline. Um, so yes, we would, if this gets approved, we would get it out in July. The circuit can start August or September of this year. We can put it in um, the summer next year. So about a year from now, maybe June, June, July, July next year, it can be completed. But when will the one that we start? Um, probably not. Probably not until... Until the end of this year, but probably spring next year. You hear that? Yeah. Okay. All right, we're going to do the two readings, and we're going to, we need to move on. We get some other things, uh, and then we'll uh, we'll look at you know ways to make it safer, ways to slow down traffic, um, and then we'll see. You know, and you know, I, I'm not going to say it's the past. We'll, we'll decide that in a month, and we'll go from there. Anything else you want to add before we read the ordinance? Well, this ordinance is this one right here, right? So the only thing we can do is change the one way. We can't add, I mean, the stop signs and Roman strips are going to be all up to U.S. side. Right, right, right. So the only thing that this group can approve is just changing, making it down a one-way street. Instead of a two -way. Yeah. Hopefully, but we can't, USI's got to come up with some of these extra safety issues that we've raised. Right, well, we're, you know, yeah, yeah. 
So let's go ahead and uh, Brian goes take a motion. Make a motion for the first reading of ordinance 12.14 for the final Go ahead, play that. It doesn't matter. It, no, it's going to matter. Okay. Um, you have to read it. Oh, all in favor say aye. Uh, ordinance number 12-2024, ordinance to amend the traffic. <coughs>
had a thousand dollars in request is. Uh, I talked to him briefly. Uh, we're taking the information tonight on what they what they're wishing to do. Certainly, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Greg Majeski. I'm with Keller Development. We are a developer, general contractor, property manager based in Fort Wayne. We are proposing to construct a senior, independent, affordable uh, apartment community at <coughs> properties. At 1329 College Avenue and the associated parcels, there's four or five different parcels in that area, totaling about 4.1 acres. Um, we are going to have a few requests coming down the pipeline between now and the end of July. So this evening, I appreciate um, the chance to just give you a brief summary to respect the rest of the evening and what's on the agenda. To tell you about this project, what we're asking for, and to take your concerns and any questions so that we can fully address them at the time we're actually on the agenda to have an action taken. So just about us, we're a um, family-owned company based in Fort Wayne, founded in 1957. We do communities like this throughout the state of Indiana, as far south as the Ohio River, as far north as about the Michigan line up in Angola. Uh, we have over 50 of these that we've developed and built. Um, we also manage them with our affiliate company. We're intending to do the same thing here. We want to do senior housing, which is defined as people 55 and older, we are looking at doing 35 units in a single building. It would be two stories, served by an elevator, fully sprinkled. Um, that's a bit smaller in scope than the last time um, we, we met with you. We met with Mayor Odell. I, I spoke with Councilman Smith about this a little bit. We're finding that this property is challenging in terms of topography, so we had to scale back. The 35 is what we are going to propose. Two bedroom units, we will have full kitchen, full bathroom, a washer dryer in the unit. We have an on-site leasing office, on-site community space. We'll have some outdoor areas too, like a you know, picnic shelter and a fenced dog area. Yeah. Um, we will be requesting a zoning change to accommodate this. Right now the property is zoned R1, we need R2 to accommodate. We will also be requesting tax abatement. Um, the reason for that is that we are applying for <coughs> something called the Rental Housing Tax Credit, which is administered by the state of Indiana on an annual basis. It is a competitive program, and if we receive these tax credits, we sell them to investors to finance 85%, give or take, of the total development cost. So it's very important for this specific project. And part of what the state wants to see is a local financial contribution, but also it will assist with the long-term sustainability of the development. It has to stand on its own. We as a company are not injecting it with cash so that it can continue to operate. It will be essentially its own entity, generating its own revenue, paying its own bills indefinitely. And we keep these long term. We are a small time developer. Um, we keep what we build. Um, that's what we intend to do here. As far as, as far as the affordability of it goes, the rents will be set to be affordable to people and seniors of modest incomes. And that's really the extent of the program. There's, there's no subsidy. There's no you know, public benefit to people living there. The rents will be what they are, and they're going to range between about let me give you these numbers. Uh, about 460 to 835 dollars per month. So attainable to people, especially if they're on fixed incomes. And the program says we will do all of this as long as you make it affordable to people with modest means. That's defined as households making up to 80% of the Fulton County median income. Because we're um, serving seniors, we will be serving mostly single person households, a few two person households. The income limit for a single person is $45,440 annually. <coughs> for a two person household, that's $51,920 annually. And for seniors who are either retired or maybe still working or have a pension or savings or something like that, we find that once you're into that upper age bracket, um, it's very easy for someone to qualify into this program, even if they were not um, typically what's, what's, who would be considered to be certified affordable housing. So with all of that said, um, so to be respectful of your time, I, I welcome any questions, concerns, uh, other details. I'm not prepared to get as into the weeds as you'd like tonight, but I also understand that you're not going to take any action. We've also been here for two hours. So. I, I talked to Greg briefly before, and uh, I have talked to Baker Tilly, and they're not the only developer that's looking to do something here in Fulton County or here in Rochester. Um, 
TIF district, the um, abatement question, the request, all that has to be laid out uh, in, in ways that I don't think any of us up here understand completely. So we're relying on a professional to make utility in Creek to Bolt to kind of lead us down as <coughs> offer abatements, you know, um, how does that affect what we need to do on the TIF side and so forth. Um, I have a, a meeting I'm trying to get scheduled with them so that we have a, a greater understanding of what we need to do not only with you but with other developers uh, that I think would be prudent before we act on this. But I am familiar, as we've met before, uh, with what they're wanting, um, similar to what other developers are wanting as well. So I told them to make a presentation. Uh, we would look at this in four weeks at our next meeting and make a decision. By that time, we'll have a lot more information from, from our professionals. Greg, you said okay with that sure. from a timeline standpoint. Yeah, and I do want to just make one more point since tax abatement seems to be where the most questions might come from. Is that abatement is for the improvements only. Right now this property is unimproved except for a shed that I think is contributing about $60 annually to the city's tax revenue. So the taxes would continue to be paid basically as they are right now, even if abatement is granted. And then as soon as that wears off, <coughs> we're, we're putting a significant amount of investment in improving the property. So. And if I understand correctly, any abatement we offer, because there is a, a local match to this program, any abatement we offer can be applied toward the local match we understood it from another developer that we understand. Yeah, so the benefit is twofold. It's a small project and it's limited in the revenue it can generate because of who it's serving. So anything that helps offset the operating costs is going to benefit the project, help us keep it looking nice, operating smoothly long term. But to compete for this program and to receive that funding, the state prioritizes a local financial contribution and the savings from a tax abatement um, counts, it, it goes directly towards that. And that, just, just to give you an example, um, that scoring category, the financial contribution, it's worth about four points on a 150 point rubric. We have won and lost projects by a half a point, a quarter of a point. So it is very cut from competition. Um, the other developer that we've spoken with is in the same boat. Um, I, I don't know who it is, but I, I imagine that they probably told you kind of the same thing. And we can't. We have to try to account for any possible point to score this to get funded, because otherwise, 85% of the construction budget is not there in the project can't happen. <coughs> That's two very important mistakes to make. Question. Question. So, like in your note, in your letter, it says uh, full 10 year property tax abatement up to 100%. Is that what they expect, or is it going to be that less is, than 100%? That is what we are asking for, and I say that with my hands held humbly because that is a very big ask. We fully acknowledge that. We've done it several times in some other communities um, recently. We've found that on an unimproved property, um, it's less of an ask because it's not generating the revenue right now, but it doesn't have to be that. We could do a more typical step in abatement. Um, I, I certainly don't want to compare you to Fort Wayne, but the city of Fort Wayne realized that if they want to win funding from this program, they need to come up with something. So they came up with a front-loaded abatement schedule specifically for projects like this, where it's um, maybe a full abatement in years one through five, and then stepping down 50, 40, 30 in the five years following that. And that would not disqualify you from being able to receive? No, no. The more savings we can demonstrate, the better for, for our application. <coughs> but it certainly doesn't have to be all enough. And, and the abatement process is we've been told by Baker Tilly is every project stands on its own merit. We have to look at it from our standpoint, what the benefit is to our community, what the cost that we might incur to get the infrastructure into your project. Uh, all those things come into play as far as, and then we, we basically set whatever payment schedule we want uh, and, and offer them back. Then. So that's why we need some professional help on this on all these areas to be able to be fair to you or to any developer. So anything else for Greg? Uh, you say you uh, would be possible for the past 15 years to get give me or all of us a list of the you know, projects in very, very cities? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. And here's the other thing that we've fallen into, what we, you know, we've fallen into, but a lot of these projects are privately owned 
landowners that really have changed <coughs> the developer. We have no say in the developer. I mean, if, if, if the landowner chooses you, they choose you. We can't come in and say, no, you got to use because it's not our decision to make. Am I correct in saying that? Right, yeah, we're a private company. Um, we had an opportunity with the landowner in this particular location. We kind of had to strike while the iron was hot. Um, the time frame is faster than we would have wanted. The state set its policy in March. We got an application due in July. They, they kind of put us in a bind. But because this is what we do, um, and we feel like we're pretty good at it, we are we're trying to make it happen. I get it. I get it. I've been <coughs> stressed by this whole thing, too. So, all right. Thank you, Greg. Anything else for you? Yeah. Great. Why the 80% AMI instead of going for the 65 for your funding work? So the program expanded about five years ago to allow us to go up to 80 mm -hmm. as long as the average of everybody is not greater than 60. So okay. the numbers get weird, but we will have a range of people. That's just the top. Okay. So we will have people below that. We'll have people in between. Um, they will have to have the means to pay the rent. Right? You know, if you're making no money, right, you will not qualify to live there. But that's that's kind of how it benefits the range of people. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Thank you, Greg. Dr. Hoff. Sorry. Right. Sorry, it's been so long. It's all right. who, wants to, who wants to make the presentation? You or Michael? Oh, Michael's the pro. Doc, Doc, you can go ahead and make it. <laughs> um, I am requesting tax abatement for the only <coughs> building. Um, I've been dealing with a, a national company for the last six months or so, and we've finally gotten things worked out <clears throat> where they would be on the bottom floor, which is about 5,000 square feet. And then we'll put a, apartments on the two floors above that. Um, with an elevator uh, to uh, make it accessible for everybody. Um, the renovation costs are about a half a million. Um, so I like that tax abatement for 10 years. The, uh, <clears throat> anybody that's had any experience with the old downtown buildings, it's expensive a lot easier to build something new on the edge of town but <clears throat> so anyhow we need all the help we can get for the for the downtown um, the, the um, they will have about 20 employees they think and it looks like probably an annual payroll of about a million and a half about 75,000 <laughs> I did call Baker Tilly today on this, asked Heidi, who's an expert in TIF and abatements, and through the scenario I have heard, uh, I will give you my perspective on this. Uh, this. Here's another situation where a project has to stand on its own merit. Uh, we have several factors in this that I think benefit this community. One, we have 20 pretty high paying jobs. We have six units of housing. We have a, a downtown that needs a spark that this can provide. Uh, the, uh, the one thing she would suggest to you, because we have the downtown TIF has an 18 year life left to it, she would say, she told me I would pull that parcel out and then renew it so that it has a new 25 year life. If you look at the numbers, if we give him 100% abatement, it's about on the max $20,000 a year. We'll be missing out on property tax income for, the, for, for 10 years, but then the remaining 15 years we'd be getting that. Um, so it's kind of like we're kind of investing in this community as well by giving you that or in the downtown. Um, she felt like that was a very uh, acceptable ask, uh, and I do too. So, uh, like I said, this is one of those cases where the, the community is benefiting largely because of the number of employees. Uh, and, and Greg, no offense to your project, but a, these are two totally different types of projects. That's, and we have similar projects we have to look at along your lines that we have to have further uh, 
consultation on. So um, I am, I mean, this is you guys' decision, but if, you know, any thoughts or discussion about that? Uh, can these, 20, these 20 employees, are, are they, are they going to be local individuals or are they going to be coming from out of town? Or? Um, <coughs> they'll be local. Local? Yeah. start probably uh, within 30 days, 60 days max. We think it would take six months to get it done. <clears throat> Got to redo the whole outside of the building, naturally. Um, Is it the old COVID building? No. The old Masonic building. So the, the two options for the outside is one, if we're trying to see if we can get <coughs> the uh, veneer that's on it now, uh, if we can get that matched. If we can, then we'll repair that. <coughs> if we can't, then we'll take all of that off and get back down to the bricks and then go from there, <coughs> figure out what to do with that. And you said it was commercial on the bottom and yep. then two floors of apartments. Yes. Four apartments on the second floor and two on the top. <coughs> Keeping the Masonic lighting. Yeah. 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 Keeping the Masonic lighting on the top floor. Good. Andy, is there anything that we should know on our end uh, as far as uh, language or the straight approval to work out? Yeah, the first, first step is you have to declare the property in uh, an economic revitalization area. You, that's, that's a declaratory resolution. And then you have to have a public hearing uh, uh, and, and put out notice. And then only after a public hearing you can pass a confirmatory resolution. Uh, and only then do you have <coughs> um, yeah, his, Historically, there are two ways communities do this. Number one, petitioners hire attorneys to bring that request. They prepare the ordinance, uh, uh, and they, they prepare the second ordinance, and the city's responsibility is to put out the public notice that there's going to be a public hearing. The other way to do it, larger communities that have larger staff in the treasurer's office, they have a packet of forms. You just look up St. Joseph County, has a packet of forms where someone can they do this the right way, and they charge $400 to make a request, whether it's granted or not. Okay. And so, in the past, we have never gotten enough of them to, I don't think the clerk treasurer's office has ever had a form. <coughs> um, but uh, 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 in the past, the petitioner has always prepared uh, both examples of the ordinance, and we have to have a legal description in that ordinance. We can't just list the part of the street address of the property. We have to have the, the legal description in the ordinance because it has to go through the auditor's office and they have to recognize it as the IRA. What Heidi was probably saying is, is say you should, you should redesignate this new, this particular property as an ERA so it has the longer lifespan. <coughs> I didn't talk to this probably what she was referring to. But it's a two resolution process. So you can't you can't approve an, uh, an abatement by simple motion or because there's not nearly enough information. Uh, one of the things that the petitioner has to provide is a statement of benefits. Uh, he alludes to some of those things in letters, he's mentioned a few, but that really needs to be ironed out. There's some communities who say, we want that statement of benefits up front before either resolution, but you definitely have to have a written statement of benefits, like what's going to cost, who's going to hire, because <coughs> all of the future annual confirmations of that require reference to the statement of benefits. So, uh, uh, when it comes time to renew that, you, you look at if there's a renewal request, you have a benchmark and you can say, okay, you said the project is X, you employ X amount of people, how did that work out? And that, that is something down the line. So it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of involved. It's a two resolution process, <coughs> not, not, a, not a letter and a motion. And you can actually designate one property to the economic revitalization. Yes, you have to get to this. <coughs> you what? No, you have a public meeting. No, because you have to publish notice for that hearing. That's a hearing, public hearing requires a notice, so you can't, 
the notice says we've passed the declaratory <coughs> resolution. We will consider a confirmatory resolution, the A and B. So you can't do it at one because the notice will be incorrect. You can't you can't say we might pass <coughs> both these in one one notice. And there is a form for the statement of benefits. It's called an SB1. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's a statement. <coughs> Foolish of me to think this can be a simple thing. Never that word. So, uh, so if, if we don't, <coughs> we're just letting it take its course two months. I would think that time is of the essence. So, is it possible for us to get together? Can we get that together in a week? Meet again next Tuesday, do the first, and then call the. I don't know how long it's going to take. Take it. Get the get the get the. We can still do it after this week. A resolution. Yeah. 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 I mean, if we, I would assume it's okay to we can speak to say that I like this idea and uh, we're probably going to support it. But help us get through the <coughs> steps here and we'll help, help at the end. But I don't think we have to wait for the. If they start hammering, that, that, that doesn't mean they can. That doesn't exclude them from getting the exemption, right? Well, I don't. I'm not giving advice to the petition. I'm giving it by C. Okay. And uh, the ordinance, I'm sorry, the, the state statute says the uh, uh, statement of benefits has to be filed with the body before beginning redevelopment or rehabilitation or before installing any equipment if it's a it's a first Okay. Alright, so go ahead. So we have to have the statement of benefits. Yes. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry to interrupt. There's, there's a black Jeep that has its windows down out there. It's not raining just yet, but it's gonna rain too. So let it take care of itself and whoever walked out. So it's right now it's out of our hands. It's for the petitioner to get more ducks lined up. And then uh, when we have when Beth has given what she needs to make public notice, we satisfy the timeline, we schedule a special meeting to try and expedite this as fast as we can. Sure. You can you could do a special meeting, but but it takes it takes two meetings and enough time between them. Because I don't think he wants to wait two months. I'd rather not, but we'll do whatever. <laughs> we're not we're not we're not controlling when he starts the, the work. Right. But if he wants the abatement, uh, he may want to talk to an attorney about the dangers of starting a project and then ask yeah. him for the abatement okay. later. Okay, so we'll wait to hear from combination of you three, Andy, you or your attorney or whoever, Beth, make sure we're ready to Satisfy all the, I guess not all the eyes, and then we can move forward with a special meeting. Uh, and if we can't get it done, then maybe right after, or maybe a week or so after our next regular meeting, we can do the second meeting. Okay. If that makes sense to you? Sure. Doc. Yep. We can do what we can to make it happen, but. Yep. Appreciate it. All right. Anything else? So on Andy's going to tell me what I need to do. Yeah, yeah you, you, need, you need to call McKenzie. That's what you need to do. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you call McKenzie. <laughs> yeah. He's our attorney. She told me he's our attorney. Okay, He's moving on. Mine, mine. We have some we'll tax abatements that we need to certify. Um, for continuation. Brian, I'll let you, you kind of look over this, kind of lead us through this process. Yeah, we've got um, Top Industries on their SB1, uh, CF1. Um, the estimated salaries of 2.2 million, they're at 5.9. Uh, 61 employees, they're 61 employees. Um, Tops has continued to, to uh, perform, if you want to look at look at those. So I don't see any reason why not to continue that. That's nearing its end as well. Um, we have brushes from metal products as well. Can we them all one time? Yeah, we can do them all one time. So I do want to we'll pass that. And that's, that's the original copy that has to be signed, so I'm going to look at that. But Brian's, Brian's the one that has to sign. Yeah. Is this the same thing for Brian and I? Huh? That's just continuing. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, Brian. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but we, we review it and make sure they're still fulfilling, yeah. like they have the cut, cut uh, employees and cut salary because... Uh, and it, it's done in... Um, Were they? 
Oh, oh they're in your packet. Yeah. Okay. So we've already, it's been approved. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's recertification or whatever. Yeah, this yeah. year is 19% and then next year it's 9% and then it's done. Okay. Yeah. Just to mention. <coughs> so I would make a motion to extend top abatement. I'll say, or already did. Yeah, that's my favorite. Aye. Aye. Okay, the next one will be Marshall Brushes from Metal Corp. Um, employees 281, still 281. Uh, salaries estimated 11, 8, 11 million 859, and they're over 16, almost 17 million. Um, so they're they're maintaining well, so I would also make a motion to extend Brushes from Metal's payment. Second. Bob seconded. Last one is power and transmission. Um, this one's a little they're, they're on a smaller scale, but they're continuing to, I mean, they haven't dropped anyone. Um, their salaries are 209,000, 209,000. Rochester Middles is the other one that's going to be okay. done soon. Yeah. Again, I would make a motion that we extend power transmission components as well. City, two mutual aids to Liberty Township, two to Henry Township, uh, four fire alarms in the city, three in the township, six grass fires um, in the township, and two in Newcastle Township, one vehicle fire in the city, one in Richland Township, uh, smoke and odor complaints, uh, two in the city, Accidents, we service four in the city, two in Rochester Township, two in Newcastle, one in Richland. Uh, we have medical assist of 18 in the city, nine in Rochester Township, two in Newcastle, four in Richland. One gas bill in the city, one CO check, one service call, and one canceled call for a total run number of 70 runs in the month of April. Okay. Do you have my report? Let me know if you have questions. Thank you, Chief. You're doing a good job. <laughs> okay. Uh, For the sake of saving time. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Street Department. Good evening. Um, just a few things I'd uh, like to talk about. Uh, one, as far as the report goes, uh, we started the uh, banner swap out today from the military banners to the artwork. Um, my guys stayed overtime tonight. We are half done. We'll get the other half done tomorrow. So it'll be a two day swap out. Uh, so if you get any phone calls, America, then you know how to answer that now. Um, this past week had uh, three of our people from the street department and six from the wastewater. Uh, and CDL training all week. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, that meant half of my crew was um, involved in this, and so a lot of like back pickup got delayed. Um, and they actually, um, we knocked all that out today. I have two new trucks that I ordered back in December. Just got notified that they've issued the VIN numbers 
which means that they're going to start production on those trucks and I should have them within the next four to six weeks. And then they will go uh, to get the uh, dump beds put on. Um, we also, uh, just in the last week, received our air burner that we ordered that will take care of burning all of our brush that we collect um, on a daily basis and when we have storms. And, and I don't know if I've talked to the city council, I know I've talked to the, the uh, Board of Works about this, but this unit looks a lot like a big roll-off dumpster. It's got an engine on the end that drives an impeller that blows uh, air across the top of it and also into the box. It reburns the smoke, so um, it, you, it burns like 90% of the smoke particulate. So basically what you see is heat waves coming off of it. It's a lot cleaner than digging a hole and just burning in a pit and uh, it's a lot more controlled this way and cleaner. So um, we're really looking forward to start using that. Um, the other two items I have, and I gave you a sheet <coughs> uh, that looks like this. Uh, if you're not aware, at 180 Fulton Street, what has been commonly called uh, the Forest Farms building is, uh, belongs to the street department. It's uh, extra storage for us. Um, the area is also where we put our salt barn a couple years ago, and it's also where we have all our storage for our uh, different aggregates, the different gravels. Depending on how things go with the waste uh, water, or I'm sorry, the uh, stormwater ordinance, and however that utility gets started up, um, one of the future things we're looking at is potentially moving the street department to this location uh, to make room for the stormwater utility at the wastewater plant. Um, so in doing all that, we've had problems in the past with people back there and trying to secure that area. Uh, I wanted to put a fence up, put a security fence around that property, which I thought, again, like the mayor, was going to be a simple thing and it's turned into a kind of a complicated thing. So uh, with that said, uh, what we have is um, back in like the early 1900s, that whole area out by where the uh, um, well, cross the road tracks where you've got the scale barn and all that, that had originally been platted with streets and properties and all that. And so if you look and you see like it says Alt Street and some others there, most of that has been vacated, and J Street actually, uh, this city council vacated a portion back in the 90s. And for some reason, this one section behind Forest Farms never got vacated. So uh, we have to do a vacation for that. And um, basically, what I'm looking for from the city council tonight is approval or a go ahead to have that ordinance. Um, generated so that we can bring that to you at the next meeting so that we can get that portion of J Street vacated. Um, the other portion that you see, the little triangular piece, was another surprise. Um, we have a drive on the north side of that building that we always thought that the city owned that property. Um, and then when I talked to Seth White, uh, he asked me where I thought the property line was and I told him it's there's a natural fence line along there. Well, that's not where it's at. It was actually almost right up against the building. And so now um, I've already engaged John Little, um, and we've had discussions with the uh, property owners of the railroad to uh, purchase that small triangle piece of property so that we can put our fence up. So uh, that part is already in work, but. Um, uh, the part for the city council will be uh, vacating that portion of J Street. So, Andy, that I'm assuming you mentioned going forward with an ordinance to that effect, correct? Yeah. We so, do, do we, we need to vote to go forward or just wait? Your only, your only vote would be uh, uh, granting uh, the vacation. In other words, you don't need to vote tonight. Just, I think he's looking for authorization to proceed. Because it's a little unusual to have the city department be the petitioner to vacate something. And I said, I, we talked about it, and I said, well, uh, I, if there are no dissenting votes. But other than that, it would be the same as any vacation. The only difference here is uh, that Dwayne or his department would essentially be the petitioner 
but we'd still need to proceed with making the request, notifying adjacent property owners, and then I would prepare the ordinance next month. And then we would vote on that. And you vote on that? Right. So we're ready right. to say, verbally saying, hey, go for it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> what do we need to have a vote? Yeah, say? Yeah. Public hearing. Yeah, public hearing as well. Yeah. And just, just okay. to add to this a little bit, and what he explained, because I thought my, my question was, it's already, I mean, the city already, it's already kind of like the city's, but he said it's not. It's actually public. It could still be a public street, so we need to take that out of our inventory, per se, and bring that in as the property. And I've already talked to um, the uh, odd fellows who are the other property owner on the other side and they are not interested in any of that property as well so when we vacate we're going to be asking for the whole piece there okay so we're going forward with that for an ordinance to be drawn up for that vacation correct and we're also looking at circle drive which is another set of maps you have right here that was we call it circle drive it doesn't really does it have a name no it doesn't um I just called that just to simplify the fact that it is a circle and for lack of a better term to use. Um, and in this, um, so so what we have is the, um, the city already maintains the drive around the park. We plow, we plow it, we patch it. Um, we also, uh, the police patrol it. Um, it's used as a street that's an extension of 13th Street for people to get around over to Park Street. Um, and so um, we were looking at ways that we could improve that area around the park. And so um, what we were looking at is um, adding that into our street inventory, which would require a change in the street ordinance to add that. Once it's in our inventory, then it uh, qualifies for community crossing grant for paving. And uh, part of what we were looking at too is to expand, one, to improve the parking that we already have there and make it some, ded some dedicated parking areas with parking blocks and parking lines and all that and clean that up because what we've had and uh, what we have now in our current state is where people are just parking wherever and the park, some of the parking spaces keep migrating closer and closer to the pavilion because people want to walk less and less <laughs> to them. So uh, reestablish parking lots that are that are paved and you know proper um, markings, and also to expand some of that so we can add some parking because one, if you've ever been out there when it's been baseball games, they park everywhere, and so um, what what we're going to request at this time is that this be added into our street inventory. When we get to where we do the actual project, and this will be like next year, and the other portion is going to be walking and uh, bike path around the park. Um, so, um, and then we'll put the, all the parking spaces in and all that at that time. So, um, I talked to Chief Shots about trying to figure out if there was any downsides to doing this. I'm sorry, no, he's been positive about it. Basketball courts. The basketball courts. That, that, the only, we're going to have to add signage, of course, for one way and all that. Uh, the speed limit won't change. We'll keep it at 10 miles an hour. But um, the potential problem is going to be uh, people are going to want to turn right to go to the basketball court because it's 100 feet away. Um, now, my plan is that they would, that the parking would be angle parking, um, so that even if they went that way, they would have to, it would be very difficult for them to turn back around to park. So, um, anyway, that's the next plan we're working on. I've presented this to the park, the parks department is in support of it. Um, because it takes the responsibility to maintain that off of their shoulders and puts it on the city. So do we need, we don't, this isn't an ordinance thing, is it? We're just receiving this uh, from the park as a, to bring into our inventory? Yeah, you could, you could vote to approve to bring it into your inventory. Um, I think that uh, there needs to be some coordination with the park board. Uh, I, 
my preference would be to have the park board uh, pass a resolution to essentially release it from their from their they oversight jurisdiction. They did, didn't they? They voted to release it. Did they already vote it? Really? I think it's yes. They voted to release it last park board meeting. Right. You were there. You were there. Mm -hmm. If you want to vote to accept it in the inventory, I can research it, and if it requires uh, uh, a, a resolution, I can prepare it later. I think once you accept, vote to accept it, it's up to the Board of Public Works to determine um, uh, naming it. But when Dwayne comes back later and wants to do one ways or other restrictions, that, that will come back in front of you. Gotcha. Okay. So, we have the park board's already voted. If you want to vote to accept yeah. it, then. I know they voted on it. So, I uh, need a motion to accept it. So, moved. Second. Amy, second. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. <laughs> All right. <coughs> uh, quickly, Fedco, uh, you got anything for us? No, you pretty much dealt with everything I've been doing uh, <laughs> lately. Uh, the only other thing that I'll add to it is um, <clears throat> when I first came, there was a lot of controversy over Blackheader Drive and whatnot. Um, getting to where it, it needs to get finished. It'll be finished later this summer and I have already contacted a uh, professional site selector in Indianapolis and they're going to advertise the site for us for free for about six months. So, um, and there is some interest out there in uh, a couple of the lots. So I'll just leave it at that for tonight. Okay. RDC, uh, real quick, um, we voted last Two weeks ago, we had a special meeting, voted to purchase uh, the, the road in front of uh, the hotels for $25,000 off the hotel owner. Uh, he signed the agreement. We um, are in the process of getting a survey, which should happen this week. Uh, McDonald's Corp is okay with just giving us their part of the deal for us to take under our inventory. The extension, the landowner for the east, I have uh, email agreements to all that, giving us the area we need for the road extension. Um, Walmart local said that they would uh, be interested in an entryway at the, at the west end of the parking lot. Um, so everything's coming together on that. The other thing is we voted to basically 25-5 put toward the interior wall to shore up huts as we are in the process of trying to get her back in uh, to open business for public. Uh, I had a call into a structural engineer today that didn't get back with me. We're trying to finalize that, Andy. Okay. Uh, did you get anything further from Gary on that? He, I think your email said to kind of go through CE Solutions, I remember now. Yeah. So I've, I've got that call out there, but I haven't heard. Um, we're trying to get numbers on the outside of it, see how far we're going to go with this whole thing. So more information later. That's kind of where we're at on that right now. So, our board. They met on May 13th and had a very lengthy discussion about <laughs> <laughs> parks. <laughs> uh, they did vote to approve uh, the uh, five-year plan engineer, yes. engineering firm, which was USI, to proceed with that. So a lot of the major decisions are going to be uh, put into that five-year plan. So anything else on that, Bob? I don't think anybody wants to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody from any other board have anything you want to add? Water, anybody? Water, board, water board, he sent a nice letter out to everybody. They were more than welcome to read it. <laughs> animal shelter is a rock star. That has the notes. <laughs> um, animal shelter does good work. Good. Janet Shelley. Good. What was the Brian Tree Border in the Rain makes the trees grow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Before we uh, before you guys leave, we got some things we need to sign. So uh, I need a motion. Need a motion to adjourn. We don't have any other motion. Amy moves. Right. John Garrett seconded. All in favor? Hey. 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 Hey